Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, my webinar. I'd like to say, uh, uh, first of all, thank you to the Dean of the school for the opportunity to, to deliver this session. Um, the purpose of, of the web webinar uh, is to explore how we can create effective multiple choice assessments. And um, from my experience and from working with colleagues, we find that it's often challenging uh, to write good multiple choice questions um, that do more than just test the student's memory. So by, uh, by the end of today's webinar, um, I hope to share some of the practices that we have implemented uh, at my university, my institution, um, but also share some research that has been published based on uh, this particular topic. Of you, we will explore um, some of these. Well, we will explore all three uh, main areas. The first, we'll look at uh, the general structure of multiple choice questions. Um, this is something that you may or may not be familiar with, but I think it's important that uh, we start with with looking at the general structure and then build on on this. Next, we'll look at constructing effective multiple choice questions. Um, I have broken this element into two parts. First, we'll look at how we can design um, really good effective STEM questions. And here I will be going through examples and practical tips uh, to help uh, you understand the various strategies um, and approaches that I want to share with you. Next, we'll then look at how to construct effective answers or um, what we call alternatives and to identify some of the common error, errors uh, when it comes to writing multiple choice items. And lastly, we'll look at um, designing multiple choice questions to test higher order thinking. Um, here I will share some of the pedagogical research in relation to, to this um, topic and I'll share some practical examples of how um, we've implemented uh, this in our own assessments um, and hopefully that would help you create uh, multiple choice questions that assess all levels of thinking not just um, applying knowledge or recalling information. So let's take a look at uh, the anatomy of a multiple choice question. Now, by definition, a multiple choice question is a question which students are asked to select one alternative um, from a given list of alternatives in response to a question. Now, a good multiple choice question will consist of these three main parts. First of all, you will have a STEM question um, and the STEM question will identify the question scenario or a problem in the, uh, in the multiple choice item. Next you'll have the correct answer. Uh, the correct answer is also known um, as the key followed by uh, several plausible but also incorrect answers which are known as distractors. Now a good multiple choice question should have all these three elements within it um, to, and students are expected to respond to a multiple choice question by indicating which alternative they believe is the best um, answer or which alternative best answers the STEM. Now, if we take a look at um, this example here, I've just um, put, to put together a, a really simple question, multiple choice question, where students are asked to express 50 milligrams into kilograms. Now, if we have a look at this example, the question here um, is, would be known as the STEM question. The STEM question doesn't always have to be a question, it could be a brief scenario or a case study. So there is scope with, with regards to how you design your STEM 
if we have a look at the options, um, these are known as um, alternatives. So within uh, the multiple choice item, you will have a list of alternatives that the students can select. Now, the alternatives are usually presented vertically, not horizontally, uh, and preferably in numerical or chronological order to make it easier for the students to read and also to answer the question. Within the list of alternatives, you would usually have the key, the key answer, and then the list of distractors as well. And the list of options um, should have one correct answer only. But if you notice, the distractors are also plausible answers, even though they are incorrect. So just to summarise um, the brief overview with regards to the general uh, structure of a multiple choice question, um, students should be able to select one alternative from a list of uh, alternatives presented in that multiple choice item uh, in order to respond to a question. Uh, and the question, the multiple choice question should also have a single uh, correct answer uh, amongst a list of incorrect answers. And just to kind of explain, um, after each of my um, of my topics, I will uh, open the floor for you to ask any questions based on what I've covered before we move on to the next uh, topic. So um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask based on um, the general structure or the anatomy of multiple of a multiple choice question? Um, thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. So if there is any questions, you can go through the Q&A section. The screen will be having a Q&A. You can proceed your questions there. Okay. Clarifying the questions, we will move to the next session. Okay, perfect. I think in Q&A, there is two, two questions are there. Uh, can you pick? Um, yes, yeah, so there was a question that said that would there be recording or would the, the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation from this webinar, would it be available after the webinar? Um, yes, I'm happy to, to email a copy of um, the slides that I will be uh, presenting in today's webinar um, for you to refer to um, at a later date. So yes, that's, that's no problem. I think uh, there is a question It is there from the, Dr. Dalia. Yes, um, so there's another question that asks, does it matter how many incorrect, uh, incorrect answers we have? Um, so common practice is to have um, anything from a minimum, minimum of three alternatives up to five um, alternatives as your options. So let's say we have four alternatives one should be the correct answer and the other three should be incorrect answers so um, it could be so your list of alternatives could range from three to five and within that number there should be one um, key or correct answer from from your list Um, there's another question that asks, um, what is the ideal number of alternatives? Um, again, it could be anything from three to five. Um, in what we do uh, at, at my institution, we um, have a list of four alternatives uh, and we just keep that number consistent, not just throughout the module, but also throughout the department as well. Okay, I have another question that says, um, is, it necessarily, is it necessary to have four options? Again, no. Um, sometimes constructing multiple choice questions can be quite time consuming. Um, and apart from setting a STEM question, you've got to find or put together a list of alternatives. So um, if it's quite hard or quite challenging to have a list of three distractors, um, limit it to, to two distractors along with one um, 
key answer as part of your multiple choice question. Right, I've, um, there's a question about best answers. I'm not too sure what, uh, what um, the question is asking, um, but I'll try and answer it anyways. So um, when it comes to multiple choice, you can have two types. You can have um, a, a single correct answer. So that's essentially from the list of alternatives, there's only one correct answer. Um, you could also have alternative uh, multiple choice questions where um, from the list of, let's say, four alternative answers, students must choose the best answer. So the list of four alternatives are plausible, are correct, um, but only one best answers or best suits the question at hand. Um, in our institution, um, we apply, um, we base our multiple choice questions on um, the single best answer approach. Okay, so there's a question um, that asks, can we add the answer options such as all of the above or none of the above in an MCQ question? Um, I'm very glad that you've asked that. Um, that will be something that I will be covering in the next uh, slides. Um, but just to give you a quick answer, um, I would say avoid uh, using answer options such as all of the above or none of the above. And in my next slide, I will explain why. Um, but just as a quick answer, I would suggest avoiding it. Um, okay, okay, we can go move to the next session, I think. Uh, yep, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine, we can go to the next Okay, um, I will be happy to answer all the remaining questions if, um, if we have time at the end. Okay, so next we are going to um, look at um, how we can construct effective multiple choice questions. Now, there are so many advantages to using multiple choice uh, questions for assessments. Um, one, uh, it's easy for us to mark. Uh, two, it um, can be used to assess uh, it can be used in as, as an assessment for um, a large class size or a large cohort, um, but also a well-designed multiple choice question allows us to uh, test a wide breadth of content uh, and learning objectives as, as well. But it, it's also reliable in the fact that um, students are less likely to guess the answers if we um, construct our multiple choice questions effectively. So in this section, I will be sharing some suggestions based on research and from my experience of how you can um, design effective multiple choice questions. If we begin with um, strategies for designing our STEM questions, um, there are four key principles that um, I incorporate in my own practice, um, which I'd like to share with you. The first uh, principle is to make sure that the STEM question or the case study or the brief scenario is meaningful by itself. Um, what I mean by that is that um, each STEM should be based on a specific problem and not multiple. Um, for example, we can do this by asking ourselves, what is the learning outcome that we want to assess for this particular question. So with multiple choice questions, you're usually um, testing a much smaller, a much, uh, a more focused piece of knowledge for each question. So if we are, um, approach our design um, for the STEM question in this way, not only do we ensure that uh, we're examining students' knowledge based on the learning objectives uh, for that particular course or that particular module, but it also helps our students understand what they're being asked. The next uh, important thing um, which falls under this first principle is to make sure that we express the full problem in the STEM. Now, 
um, if we if we express the full problem in the stem that makes no room for ambiguity or uncertainty from the student's point of view um, with regards to what the question is asking them to do. So as a guide, um, and again, I, I, I implement this in my own practice, um, when you're writing uh, your own STEM multiple choice, ask yourself, ask yourself this question, would a student be able to answer the question without looking at the list of alternatives? Um, if the answer is no, um, then it's likely that the STEM question isn't clear enough um, and you may need to rephrase the question better. And we'll look at some examples in, in the next slide. But I wanted to cover this last element. So the last thing, which also falls under this first principle, is that we want to make sure that the STEM question um, test the student's understanding, not just testing their mem memory or um, ability to recall information. Sorry. Yes. Sorry for interrupting you. No, it's fine. No, we cannot see your slides. Oh, apologies. Can you see them now? Yeah, yeah. It's, now it's appearing, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So um, I've just been talking from, uh, based on uh, the first principle. Sorry for interruption again. Uh, can you repeat it? Because the audience, they... Uh, yes, they yes. Missed the, they missed the slides, please. That's absolutely fine. Okay, right. So... Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. No, that's not a problem at all. Okay, so the first um, strategy that I want to share with you with regards to designing uh, STEM questions are four key principles um, that we can use to that we can incorporate in our own practice. So the first key principle uh, is to make sure that um, the STEM question or the case study or the brief scenario is meaningful by itself. Um, so for example, um, I would suggest structuring the STEM question based on a specific problem uh, and not a range of problems. Um, and we can do this by linking uh, a learning objective to the multiple choice question. Um, with multiple choice questions, uh, you're testing a much smaller, a more um, focused piece of knowledge with each question um, so that if we approach our designing of the STEM question in this way, so make it more specific, make it more focused, we ensure that we're examining the student's knowledge based on the learning objectives um, for, that, for that course or that module. It also helps our students to understand what they're being asked to do as well. Uh, the next uh, element which falls under this principle is to ensure that we express the full um, problem within the STEM question um, so that there can't be any room for um, uncertainty from our students point of view with regards to what the question is being asked of them. So if we make sure that the STEM question is written full, fully clearly the students are clear with regards to what, uh, what they need to do, how they need to answer the question. As a guide um, it's useful when you're writing your question to ask yourself, would a student be able to answer the question without looking at the list of alternatives? And if the answer to that question is no, then your STEM question isn't clear enough. Um, and then you may want to reword or rephrase that STEM question so that when they read the question, they should be able to answer it without having to look at the list of alternatives. The last thing uh, which also falls under this first principle is that we want to make sure that um, the question, the STEM question tests the student's understanding and not just the memory or um, ability to recall information. Um, and we'll have a look at higher order thinking as part of this, uh, apart, as part of the webinar. Um, and I'll share some practical um, suggestions of how you can structure your multiple choice questions so that it tests higher order thinking, it tests the student's ability to apply information um, and interpret information. 
So I have an example here of um, a multiple choice question, which basically is, um, which says what you should not do. Uh, so I've got this question here, and I think I feel that this this STEM question isn't meaningful. If you look at um, simply the STEM question itself, it doesn't clearly state what the problem is. It says which of the following uh, is a false statement. Um, and if you were just given this question in your exam, in an exam, um, you wouldn't be able to answer the question clearly without having to look at the list of alternatives. So um, to emphasize the question should be based on a specific problem which is linked to the learning objective, but also you should express the full question in the STEM so that the student should be able to answer it without looking at the list of alternatives. The next um, approach uh, or principle um, is to avoid using excessive wording or irrelevant information in the STEM. Um, when you're writing STEM questions, try and use familiar language and same terminology that um, that you've used in the course, in the lectures, in the workshops, in the tutorials, language that students have been um, uh, are used to hearing you say uh, and are, are familiar with. Research also shows that the use of relevant, irrelevant uh, material in multiple choice questions also decreases the, rel the reliability and validity of the test scores as well, um, as it's very difficult to indicate what knowledge the students have. Um, you can't tell if the student has clearly understood the question or if the student doesn't know the answer to that question. Um, and if students are confused um, by the question, they tend to waste time trying to understand the question instead of focusing their time on answering the question. And also students, um, to help students with this, it's, it's very um, important to use simple sentence structure, precise wording or terminology um, so that the STEM question is easy to understand. Um, and as a guide, um, as, uh, as we design our, our questions, is to um, be very accurate with our word choices um, so that the question is clear um, and if, if you're certain and if you're confident that your question uh, is clear, easy to understand, then it gives you a better indication um, with regards to the student knowledge by what they select as their answer. So I have an example here of um, a, an example multiple choice question where there's too much information. Um, there's some elements of the question are irrelevant um, and the question could be um, simply uh, rephrased um, by what I would suggest including this element here. So just simply asking what the characteristic of a sim, uh, of a what, simply asking what characteristic is relatively constant in mitochondrial uh, genomes. Um, the information at the top is irrelevant, is not necessary to help the students answer the question. So the better way of um, rephrasing the question uh, would be here. It's, it's straight to the point. It has the key terminology um, without having to look at the list of alternatives. The, a student who has, um, who has studied, who revised, um, should be able to answer the question without looking at the list of alternatives. So that's just a, an example, practical example of, of what I mean by avoiding the use of irrelevant information um, in your um, STEM question. The next key um, principle is to um, avoid negative statements. Um, so statements such as which of the following is not correct. Um, other negative phrases are never, unless, rarely, um, things like that. Um, I would suggest avoid using it 
Again, research has shown that students often have difficulty understanding items with negative phrasing. Um, it, quite, it, it, it has an impact on their um, cognitive processing uh, and, they, and, and yes, yeah, students often struggle with that element. Um, but there are times where uh, you have to use negative phrasing, uh, maybe because um, the learning outcome of your course requires it, um, then I would suggest the following. So um, if you are going to use uh, negative phrasing, um, the item should, your, your, your same question should be, should be phrased in a way that um, the negative phrasing is clearly portrayed. And I will show you an example of what I mean in the next slide. Um, the next important thing to remember is that um, the negative word should be placed in the STEM question only and not in your list of alternatives. So if you have to incorporate a negative statement, include it in the STEM question only. And lastly, um, any negative statement should be emphasised um, by using italics or bold uh, typing or capitals or underlined or all of the above, just so that it's clear, it stands out from the question so that the students are aware that it's a negative uh, statement. An example of this, um, I have a question here where it asks students which of the following is not a route of drug administration. So notice that um, the negative statement is uh, highlighted in bold, in capitals, and also underlined. But in my opinion, um, this question could be better uh, rephrased so that the negative statement or the negative word is not incorporated. Um, and I've got an example of how I would um, rephrase this question better. So I would rephrase this question like this. So all of the following are roots of drug administration except, and then you've got the list of um, of alternatives. I feel that this is a better way of structuring your question. Um, it still portrays uh, the message, but you're just not using uh, negative uh, phrasing in the question. The last um, principle um, that I want to share with you with regards to constructing STEM questions um, is to make sure that um, the STEM question is complete. It's not a partial sentence or a um, what we call a fill it in the missing word type question. Um, it's a complete question. Again, research has shown that um, where you have questions that have a, a blank or a gap um, increases the student's cognitive load. Um, they spend more time trying to understand, um, you know, how to fill in the gap or why there is that gap. Um, and it, it, it's not useful for you to understand if they, if they know um, the topic at hand. So do avoid using partial sentences. Um, the better way of of constructing your STEM questions is to write the whole question um, fully um, so that students can then focus on answering the question at hand um, and not worrying about uh, the partial sentence. And I've got an example here um, in this next slide. So an example of a partial sentence which uh, we should avoid in our practice would be this. So we've got a question um, and as you can see you've got this fill in um, the gap that the students have got to from the list of alternatives select the correct answer to fill in this gap here. A better way to um, rephrase or structure your multiple choice question would be like this. It's the same question um, but you're rephrasing it in a different way. And by simply looking at the question, students would be able to select the correct answer if they know it without having to look at the list of alternatives. So if possible, write the full question, um, STEM question fully and avoid using partial, um, partial sentences. 
So those are uh, the four strategies um, that I commonly implement when it comes to constructing STEM questions. I now want to share with you um, seven uh, key principles um, that are really useful when it comes to constructing your alternatives within your multiple choice um, item. So the first um, principle um, that I like to share is that uh, the list of alternatives that you include um, in each multiple choice question should all be credible and plausible answers. Um, if they're not plausible answers, um, then they don't really serve as good distractors. Um, if we have a look at this example below, you can see that all of the alternatives are relating uh, to the topic of pharmacy uh, and, and, and pharmaceutics. Um, so they're all plausible answers to this question that asks which of the following is not uh, a route of drug administration. But a student who has, who has an understanding of the key routes of drug, of, of drug delivery uh, will be able to easily, easily identify that dissolution uh, is relevant or related to pharmaceutical analysis uh, and not uh, a route of drug uh, administration. So just to emphasize uh, the, the list of alternatives should be plausible, credible um, uh, to the question. Um, something that would not be plausible would say would be, for example, replacing this um, answer with diffraction. Again, it's got nothing to do with pharmacy um, and a student who hasn't really studied or um, uh, doesn't really have a good understanding of, of uh, pharmaceutics or pharmacy would, would be able to kind of uh, see that diffraction does not relate to drug uh, administration. So remember, um, the role of, of an incorrect alternatives or the role of incorrect alternatives um, is, to deserve, is to serve as a distractor. Um, and you'll find that students who have not achieved the learning objectives will select one of the distractors as their answer. But those who have achieved the learning objectives and do really understand the topic will select uh, the correct answer from your list. Another point uh, which follows on from um, the previous point is that um, there should be only one key answer within your list of alternatives. Um, if you are acknowledging that the distractors may have an element of plausibility, um, but being aware that there should only be one best answer from that list of plausible answers. And in practice, in my institution, what we do um, to ensure that uh, we follow this principle is that we internally moderate each other's exam papers before, we, before the students sit the exams. So if I have a module that I'm producing an exam paper for, and I have a colleague who's also producing an exam paper for a different module, we'll share, we'll, we'll swap uh, exam papers and we'll look at the content, we'll look at the structure of the questions, we'll look at how the alternatives are presented and we'll moderate that, we'll give each other feedback. Um, and colleagues uh, within my department of pharmacy um, will comment on um, not just format but also we'll look at um, if the question is scientifically sound, if um, there's only one correct or one single best answer for each of the multiple choice questions. Um, if keywords in the STEM are used, if, if there's not uh, irrelevant text, just like I've uh, shared with you before in the, um, based on the key principles in designing uh, STEM questions. Um, but most importantly, we'll also give feedback on if the question really tests the learning objective for that module um, and also if the question is appropriate for the level um, of, of the cohort. So um, uh, a question or a paper for first year may, be, may require a different level or um, 
difficulty for example another exam question for final year so we like to moderately in, um, internally moderate each other's exam paper give feedback um, so that the exam question the multiple choice question um, are clear uh, and uh, it covers all the points that I'm going to cover in today's webinar another key point to mention is that when it comes to um, your alternatives um, they should roughly be at the same length uh, and also I'd like to add to that the same uh, similar content and I'll explain I'll explain that in a second um, so if your alternatives are heterogeneous in content or length um, they can potentially provide clues to students about the correct answer uh, and if that happens you're not able to determine if the student understands the topic or simply if they selected it based on the clue so I have um, an example here and as you can see the the list of alternatives are roughly the same length uh, apart from this one here um, and if you read each of the alternatives uh, they are quite similar in content so that the student once they read the question uh, and review the alternatives um, they would be able to determine uh, if they understand the topic which um, answer um, from the list of alternatives is the correct one. Now, if I had a question that was quite short for the first one, quite long for the second one, um, then it would give a clue with regards to what possibly might be the correct or incorrect answer. So try and keep your list of alternatives similar length um, if possible. Uh, the next uh, two points I wanted to share on the same slide, and that answers one of um, the questions raised earlier. Um, as your alternatives, I would suggest avoiding um, the use of all of the above or none of the above. Um, it is quite tempting to do that, um, but it's important to avoid it. Um, the, reason, the reason for this is, if we look at um, the reasons for avoiding using all of the above first of all um, when students see this as an option within the list of alternatives um, they immediately know either a two of the options are correct so the answer must be all of the above or they know that if they know that one of the questions if they see that one of the options is incorrect then they know that the answer can't be all of the above. I'll repeat that again. So if the students see all of the above, they either immediately um, think that A, either two, um, they either see or know that two of the options within the list of alternatives are correct, so that they know that most likely the answer is going to be all of the above, or if they know that one of the alternatives uh, is incorrect then they know that the answer cannot be all of the above. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important for us to avoid using um, all of the above um, within our list of alternatives. Um, if we do, we're encouraging students to guess um, the question. Um, it also suggests that the question that we have designed is it specific enough um and it's easy to it, it's easy for us to give the answer away um if we include all of the above um the reasons to avoid using none of the above um students tend to find this option quite difficult Re research has shown so having none of the above as uh, one of the list of alternatives they find that they find questions in incorporating that quite difficult to answer. Um, also, one disadvantage is that you can't really tell if the student knew the correct answer or if they guessed, guessed the answer by selecting none of the above. Um, and also, um, you only know if he or she knows that the uh, distractors aren't correct. So by incorporating all of the above or none of the above, it doesn't really tell you if the students have understood the question, uh, have met the learning objective. 
Another element uh, that I want to highlight is um, for us not to try and confuse or trick our students. Now, one suggestion um, that I just want to kind of share that we've implemented uh, within uh, my department um, is that we don't create distractors that are so close to the correct answer. Um, the best way to explain it is in this example here. So I've got similar question to um, pre um, previous, which one is the following, which one of the following is a route of drug administration? Now, as you can see, the list of alternatives are quite similar. Um, and this, I would say, is a trick, is a way of tricking our students. Um, a student may know that the correct answer is topical, but because the, 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 the distractors are so close to the key answer, um, this is an example of tricking the students. So again, we don't want to confuse them. We want to assess if they really know the answer. So avoid using um, questions that, uh, that, that are too, um, so avoid using uh, alternatives that are too close to the correct answer. The last point I want to share with you um, with regards to constructing alternatives um, is that when designing your alternatives, um, it's very important to, to vary the order of the correct answer. Um, make sure that uh, most of your correct answers aren't either option A, no, sorry, I'll repeat that again. Make sure that most of your correct answers aren't in B or C. Um, again, research has shown that lecturers uh, often position their correct answers either as B or C options, but also to vary the positions uh, and make sure that there's not a pattern for students to detect. Um, from my practice, what I normally do after I have written the STEM question and listed the list of alternatives, I then go back and reorder the position of the correct answer so that um, I'm not subconsciously um, uh, keeping the answers at B or C options and there is no pattern for students to pick up um, when they uh, sit the exam. Also, um, I think I've mentioned this, I've covered this in a question, make sure that you have at least um, three alternatives. Uh, the maximum I would suggest using is five, um, but the, the average number is four. So let's say we base our list of alternatives, uh, the number as four, there should be three distractors and one uh, key answer as part of your um, list of alternatives. So just to summarise that section, um, when designing your STEM questions, make sure that the, the, the problem is stated clearly um, as using simple terminology, um, avoiding using irrelevant information, um, avoid using net negative statements if possible. Um, if, if a negative word has to be um, included in the STEM question, make sure it's highlighted by um, italics, underlining, um, using capital letters, etc. Again, a summary for the list of alternatives, when you're um, constructing alternatives, make sure that all your alternatives should be plausible answers, but there should only be one uh, correct answer within your list of alternatives. Um, try and make sure that the the, the list of alternatives are approximately the same length in text to avoid giving away clues as to which is the correct uh, or in incorrect answer. Avoid using all of the above or none of the above uh, as an alternative option and vary the position of um, the correct answer um, to avoid students guessing or detecting a trend. So hopefully that, that section was uh, quite useful for you. I will open the floor to some questions now, um, if you have any. 
thank you dr elizabeth so it was a somewhat uh, clear section that uh, <clears throat> it will clear most of the doubts uh, there are some questions are here yes answer i think from mir jawid uh, one question was pending from the previous session i think uh, okay yes um Okay, so um, just to answer uh, a question with regards to what about one answer, which is most appropriate? Um, I, again, I'm not too sure what you mean about that. Um, I would suggest uh, having a single best answer approach, so making sure that your list of alternatives are all plausible, but there is only one best answer which um, which correctly answers your STEM question. There's a next question that asks, how much time should be given to answer each question um, in terms of time provided? Um, okay, so again, the amount of time you allocate will depend on the, the, the question, the multiple choice question, and I will I will explain and and, um, uh, and touch on this in the next topic. Um, it depends on the level uh, you are uh, asking of the students. So for example, if you're just asking the student to recall um, a definition, then you don't need to assign much time um, for the student to answer that question. Um, but if you're asking uh, a question, a multiple choice question that um, that's testing a higher order of thinking, then you need to allocate a longer time for the student to read the question, process the question, analyze the information presented in the question. Um, so the, map, the amount of time will vary based on the question, but I, I will expand on that in the next section. I think Dr. Ayu Patel has uh, helped us. He didn't ask the question. He helped with this. Oh, he helped. <laughs> yeah, he helped us. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> He's our best friend. He's from College of Medicine. Okay. Using the question mark software. Ah, right. Um, okay. Okay, I'm just uh, reading the questions. Um, Uh, there's a question um, that asks, is the term accept, acceptable? Um, yes, it is. Um, but again, I would suggest just highlighting that keyword in capitals in bold so that the students are aware um, that, um, that that keyword is, is in that STEM question. Okay, I've got a question here um, with regards to um, negative questions. So the um, question says, what is the problem with using neg negative questions? Um, so negative questions are, are suggested to be avoided because um, it requires uh, a higher amount of cognitive load for students. Normally students under the exam pressure and the stress, they read the question, but they don't really highlight or pick up on the, um, if you ask the questions that incorporate a negative word. So, um, and sometimes w when you incorporate negative questions, they, they um, it's, it's a process, research has shown in the process that requires too much negative loading on on them, so it's it's suggested to be avoided. And um, but like I said, if you do inc include it, just make sure that you emphasise the negative word, so that students don't overlook um, the question and answer the question incorrectly. There's a question that asks, um, how can a multiple choice question measure higher order of thinking? Um, good question. I will, I will explain all of that in my next uh, slide in, uh, in a few minutes.
Um, uh, this question asks about um, is it a good idea to use none of the above or all of the above? Hopefully, um, my previous slide explains why it should be avoided. Um, I, I would suggest no, um, based on uh, the information um, that I presented in the previous uh, few slides. Uh, you're answering which question, Nico? Sorry, um, I was asked. Um, Mr. Javed Ahmed's question. Uh, you skipped the so many questions before, I think. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, the questions are coming very fast. <laughs> very fast, but we can go one by one, order by order. Sure, okay. Uh, let me scroll back to the top. Okay, um, This one question from uh, Asim Muhammad Ibrahim Omar. Okay, all right. Um, That's an interesting question, yeah. Okay, so, so um, uh, question asks all of MCQs which uh, represent a uh, measure lower order of thinking, how can we prepare multiple choice to measure strategic thinking? or extended thinking. Um, okay, so I would suggest, I mean, the multiple choice questions can uh, not only measure lower order thinking, you can structure multiple choice questions to assess higher order thinking. Um, but um, I know that in my university, what we do also to kind of, um, assess uh, the, the higher levels of thinking is that we will first of all present students with a multiple choice question um, that asks them to apply or evaluate something and then we would link that multiple choice question immediately with uh, a short answer or a long answer question so that the students can then apply higher levels of thinking with regards to um, generating new concepts or um, justifying a course of action or a decision. Um, but sometimes multiple choice questions are quite restrictive with regards to just it's the way it's structured that you can't really um, uh, kind of measure high level of thinking and, and, and allow students to, to, um, to express um, various elements such as um, yeah, the ability to kind of creatively think or, uh, and things like that. But uh, hopefully I will touch uh, more on this in the next slides. Um, hopefully that will also help answer the question. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a question. Um, that I will read out just to try and help uh, understand the question. So earlier on, I said a question should be uh, should be questions so that students. Double in understanding, so I can help you. Okay, um, it's Mr. Patel's question. Um, okay, so um, yes, yeah, so Mr. Patel question um, relates to what I said earlier on that um, I mentioned that a question should be a full question without uh, so that students should be able to answer the question without looking at the choices below um, and it shouldn't start with uh, phrases such as which are the following or all of the following etc um, and uh, Mr Patel's asks um, do I think it's best to avoid this type of wording um, I, I think yes um, a, re a well constructed STEM question should be um, able to be answered in itself um, without uh, having to look at the list of alternatives so if possible avoid using which of the following because it doesn't really add any uh, context to the question um, and the question should be in itself concise should um, 
present the student with the scenario or the problem uh, at, at hand without having to look at the options. Okay, so there's a question that asks, can we make ch students choose two correct answers? Um, again, I would suggest structuring your question or the multiple choice questions to have either a single correct answer or single best answer. Um, again, your multiple choice question should be linked to a learning objective. Um, which is linked, which is relating to your module or your course. And the multiple choice question, a question should be specific and focused enough to test one element of a topic or of a knowledge of a topic. Um, and again, if you have two possible correct answers, um, you know, it, it leaves a gray area because a student might pick one instead of both, etc. So I would recommend just having one single best answer as uh, within your list of alternatives. I think for this one, I would like to add one comment. Yes, uh, please do. Uh, I think if there's two answers, that is a multiple answer question. Yes. So it's not a multiple choice. It is a multiple answer question. Right, OK. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not a multiple choice. When the, the students can have two answers, so it's a multiple answer. Yeah, so um, we... Yes, yeah, so multiple in, in in my institution we normally um, we use short answer questions so that students can provide multiple answers um, and limit multiple choice questions for for single uh, best answers. Yeah, if that helps. I think there's some question from uh, Dr. Ria here. Is, uh, is it okay to use three options instead of four? Yes, it's absolutely fine. Um, again, research has shown that three are uh, um, a multiple choice question that contains uh, three uh, um, alternatives um, is also as reliable as a multiple choice question that contains four or five. Um, so yes, it's, it's completely fine. Uh, and also as you're designing uh, your multiple choice questions, it's a lot easier for you as well if you um, keep it consistent with three or four, etc. So it's, um, research has shown um, it's fine. Um, sorry for interrupting you, Doctor. Uh, your mic is OK. Sometimes we are, your audio is very low. OK, can you hear me now? Can you, he can you hear me clearly? Yeah, clear, but uh, still low. OK. Yeah, now it's OK. I'll just adjust the mic. Yeah, please adjust, please. Is that OK? Yeah, it's not working out. Okay. Um, I'm just finding some more questions. Uh, there is one regarding the negative question statement is from Dr. Muhammad Ghazwani. Okay, so there's a question that asks, um, is, is there a maximum percentage for using negative statements? Um, okay, so negative statements is a really, really interesting um, topic. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. I would say, um, I would say in an ideal world, if if I was um, creating my uh, multiple choice, I would I would not use negative statements uh, again unless it's the learning objective um, requires it. If so, I would limit it. I would um, I would probably restrict it to a maximum of two. Um, and if if the question had to be if it was possible to rephrase the question so that there wasn't a negative word, just um, like in my example before, um, then rephrase it so there's not that negative word um, within the question. Um, so yeah, if possible, rephrase it. Um, if not, limit it um, to maybe one or two, um, just because um, of the reasons that I I mentioned before. Um, okay, I think there's a, there's, there's a similar question that I answered before, how much time should be provided to students to answer each question. Um, uh, again, the amount, of, the amount of time depends on uh, the level of difficulty of the question. Um, 
the if it's a high order thinking type question then you would need to assign more time compared to a lower order thinking question and i'll touch on that um, in uh, the next uh, slide okay there's a question that says um, when using all or none of the above does it affect um, the level of difficulty. Um, I, assuming you mean the level of difficulty with regards to um, higher order thinking, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, again, as I mentioned before, if you include all of the above, students find this uh, option the most easiest response because they can clearly see um, if they know that one answer is correct or two answers are correct, they're most likely going to select all, all of the above, which makes it easier for them. Or if they, likewise, if they know that one or two answers are, um, are incorrect, they would select all of the above. Same, um, so they find all of the above questions quite easy. None of the above questions, they find it difficult. Um, but I, again, I would suggest avoid using these two because you don't really um, assess, you, you can't really tell um, if the student really knows the answer or are just selecting one of those options because they've guessed. Um, There's a question uh, from Sarah Iqbal that is, uh, I think, something uh, interesting in the vocabulary. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, limited vocabulary, using anatonyms as structures, I uh, find or not. Um, I would say, okay, so that kind of falls along the topic of trying not to confuse or trick the students um, when it comes to creating distractors that are not that are so close to the the, the correct answer um, so um, there was a question that I used an example question um, that I used um, which um, students were asked I'm just trying to find the question again um, there was an example question um, in my previous slide where um, as a simple lower order question, uh, it, it asks students what the definition of efficacy is. Um, so yeah, you can use um, an, an anatonym, but I wouldn't, um, but I would suggest using um, distractors which are plausible answers also within the context of the subject as well um, so that it, again you're not giving away clues um, and students who really uh, have revised who've studied um, who've achieved that learning objective will be able to identify uh, the correct answer um, yeah so yeah so the the list of alternatives should be all plausible but also be relevant to the topic um, or the module, um, if that helps to answer the question. Okay, there's a question that asks, um, while making different models, is it better to change the order of the alternatives or change the STEM order? Um, okay, so, I so what I what I normally do in my practice is that um, after each after I've talked each topic I would spend time um, constructing uh, multiple choice questions based on that topic um, and then uh, put together possible uh, alternatives now changing the stem order again I don't uh, it probably wouldn't matter how the order the the question appears in the multiple choice question uh in the in the, in the exam sorry um 
that, um, like I mentioned before, your correct answer within your alternatives, the position um, of the correct answer should vary for each question um, so that you're not giving away clues to students um, uh, and uh, you're varying uh, the combination of answers. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Okay, there's a question that asks, would it not be best to place the alternatives in alphabetical order? So um, uh, a good approach would be to list the alternatives in either numerical order or chronological order um, so that, um, again, you're not giving away clues to students um, and you've got that consistency throughout. So, yeah. Are you happy for me to move on to the next um, topic and then I can answer um, some more questions at the end? Yeah, I think one more question from Dr. Ayub Patel we can answer and we can move forward further. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. So, a question uh, Dr. Patel asked. Um, oh. So which of the following, and all of the, uh, could, sorry, uh, could you help me? Uh, in the question is about which of the following and all of the following, it's better to avoid because they were asking them to look at the choices in order to answer. Such a question cannot be answered without looking at choices. Okay, so I, again, I would uh, avoid phrasing the question uh, as which of the following. Um, um, just as you said, student, uh, a student can't answer the question without looking at the choices. So um, yes, avoid um, avoid using which of the following. Um, you, um, the best best way to to structure the question would be to to incorporate a scenario or a um, um, or a uh, or kind of real life example case study as part of the question. Um, so for example, I had uh, in one of my previous slides, uh, I had a question asked about, um, so a, a rectal suppository is used to treat a fever. This would represent what type of drug delivery? That would be a better way to structure uh, the STEM question instead of which of the following. Um, but the, the, the next few slides that I am going to go through will kind of give some real practical examples of, of, of how we um, um, structure our own questions. Um, I know there is one example that has which of the following, but um, yeah, do avoid it if you can. I think we can move to the next section. Okay. Just, yeah, too much time. Then after that, we can finally we can go through the questions once again in the last. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. Yeah. I request all the participants to register your questions. We can answer you in the end of the session. Okay. So um, what we're going to look at next uh, are some strategies to to help you when it comes to designing multiple choice questions to. Um, test higher order thinking. Now, higher order thinking is, um, is more than just memorizing information and recalling or understanding information. Um, if we have a look at uh, this definition here, um, higher order thinking is defined as a cognitive process, um, which involves students um, to uh, tap into their uh, analytical, critical, or creative thinking. Um, and this is ideally what we want um, to examine and to assess um, with our students um, from first year all the way up to their final year of study. 
and uh, from experience it's it's a lot easier to design higher order questions when it comes to um, you know designing short answer questions or even longer answer questions but it is possible to um, test higher order thinking uh, within multiple choice questions so we'll look at, at some of these elements uh, in the next few slides now the various stages of uh, cognitive process can be uh, best described by using um, Bloom's taxonomy. Um, there are various learning taxonomies, um, but I, um, and we uh, within my institution use Bloom's taxonomy um, just because we like the approach and the way it's structured. Now, um, Benjamin um, Bloom described six uh, different levels of um, cognitive behavior and I've listed them here um, from the most basic um, which is at the top um, mem remembering uh, to the most complex which is at the bottom which is creating now if we go through these uh, six levels uh, and define what they mean and what they entail um, so if we look at remembering at the top remembering um, is us asking our students to recall facts or information or basic concepts concepts so that could be a typical multiple choice question where they've got to um, define uh, what efficacy is um, so they're just recalling facts the next level of bloom's taxonomy um, is understanding and here we would um, ask our students um, to uh, identify examples of, of principles or ideas or interpret the meaning of, of, a, of, a, of a principle. So that could be, for example, you know, what does professionalism uh, mean? Uh, what does professionalism in the context of pharmacy mean? So that's implying, applying uh, or interp interpreting the meaning of a specific principle. The next uh, level is applying. Uh, and with uh, application, we are asking our students to use knowledge in new situations. So knowledge that they've um, learnt from lectures, workshops, but apply in a new situation based on the given uh, multiple choice question. Um, and that could be, for example, a problem related scenario, a case study. Next, we have analysis. And here, students are asked to apply critical thinking um, to often analyze data or graphs and provide conclusions based on uh, the information that they've been given. Next level we have is evaluation and here students um, would be required to make a judgment or a decision or a course of action based on um, the information presented in the STEM question. And lastly, we've got creating, um, where students would be asked to put things together, put ideas together, um, generate creative thinking. So those are the six um, levels where it goes um, from the lowest level all the way to uh, the higher level of thinking. Um, and it's important to remember that uh, knowledge retention um, is key, is foundation for higher order thinking. So, I'm not saying that if you have a multiple choice question that simply um, asks students to um, recall facts or to interpret a meaning of something, I'm not saying that's not important, that's not relevant, it is. Um, I think multiple choice questions should vary in the level. Um, so we're asking everything from the level one, from remembering all the way up to the higher level. Um, and it should build on, on, uh, on the level because it's important for us to um, assess students' ability to recall key uh, concepts, but also to be able to analyse uh, data and information and draw conclusions. So I've got the Bloom's taxonomy um, presented in this pyramid triangle here. And we've got the levels um, from the lowest level all the way up to the highest level here. Now, based on this exams, um, the, 
the exams should normally <coughs> should be the exam questions should be aligned with learning objectives. Um, so when designing learning objectives, we need to make sure that uh, the learning objectives of the course have been clearly stated so that we can use the learning objectives to determine what level of thinking is required. And in the next slide, I'll explain that. But commonly, um, in practice, um, Bloom's taxonomy suggests that when we ask students um, to uh, understand uh, or to uh, recall facts, information to interpret a meaning of a, of a principle, that's usually lower order learning, that's lower order thinking. And commonly, um, multiple choice questions are normally based within these two categories. Higher order thinking oh, <clears throat> falls within uh, these four top categories, so from applying to creating. And commonly, you can assess higher order thinking um, based on structuring questions that either ask students to apply, analyze, or evaluate information. Now, it's very rarely uh, that you will see a multiple choice question that asks students to create um, uh, or generate new ideas. Um, it's not really appropriate for multiple choice questions. And the reason is that you can't really ask students to generate new ideas or uh, concepts within the context of a multiple choice question. It's too restrictive. Um, in, uh, for example, other assessments that is possible, for example, um, in a project, finding a project, uh, a viva, um, and quite possibly a long, um, long answer question. Yes, um, but normally within, for multiple choice questions, um, higher order thinking can be assessed by incorporating uh, these levels of blooms and lower order thinking are um, assessed by incorporating these levels of blooms taxonomy. So like I mentioned before, um, the learning objectives will help us structure and design our multiple choice questions. And from our learning objectives, we can determine um, the level of thinking that is required. And I've got this table here um, just to kind of um, explain what that means. So the table here, we've got, it lists some um, active verbs um, that are commonly used um, uh, to explain the different levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So, for example, if we have if we have a look at the the two lower levels of uh, of thinking, um, some of the verbs that you commonly find, um, if you have a learning objective that requires students to apply knowledge, within the learning objectives you'll see um, some terms such as uh, describe, um, select, uh, recall. So you'll be able to identify that, okay, okay, this learning objective only requires my student to apply lower order thinking. Likewise, um, if we look at understanding, some of the, um, the, the key verbs that you'll see within the learning objectives are um, explain, uh, discuss, um, identify. And from that, um, you can uh, structure or design uh, your uh, STEM question. So I've got an example here um, where, again, this learning objective um, requires students to be able to identify the meaning of a term. So I could, based on this learning objective, learning um, outcome, uh, put together a multiple choice question um, which requires students to uh, apply uh, their knowledge. So recall a specific fact or information or basic concept. An example of the question would be to ask students to define um, what efficacy is. And I've got my uh, list of uh, alternatives. Um, and if they meet and achieve the learning outcome, a student would be able to identify um, that uh, the meaning of efficacy is also um, option B, potency. If we have a look at um, 
the higher order thinking um, levels of learning uh, and look at some of the active verbs that are required. Again, uh, learning objectives will have things such as apply, um, demonstrate, interpret, um, so that you'll know that in order to meet this particular learning objective that has one of these um, these verbs, I need to have a multiple choice question which requires students to apply their knowledge, uh, to uh, analyse data, to interpret something, to explore relationships, to draw conclusions based on the information presented in the STEM question. If we look at analyse, these are some of the key um, key verbs, again, to analyse, to compare, uh, to different, differentiate. If we have a look at evaluate, you've got some of the keywords um, to appraise, to summarise, to assess. Um, and I won't include create because you can't really assess um, or uh, design multiple choice questions to um, assess creative thinking. So some examples, um, if we had a learning objective that asked students to apply previous acquired knowledge to a given situation, the key word here is apply. Um, and that fits in with the Bloom's taxonomy level of application. So um, a suitable question would be, um, which of the following, and I appreciate I've started the question with which of the following, but the question, if you read it in, in context, you, a student should be able to answer the question fully um, based on reading the, the, the question itself. So which of the following blood tests is used in the diagnosis and treatment of diabetes? So the student will need to apply their knowledge of um, the topic of uh, diabetes and how it's diagnosed and its treatment in order to select the correct answer from the list of um, <clears throat> alternatives. Now it can be really useful and helpful to design questions that require multi-logical thinking. Um, by that I mean um, thinking that requires knowledge of more than one fact in order to logically answer the question. And I'll, look, and, uh, and I'll show you some examples of um, how a multiple choice question can, uh, uh, can cover this as well. So just some um, examples of how you can approach structuring uh, multiple choice questions in order to assess higher order thinking. Um, one approach that we use um, at my, in my, within my department um, is that we use real life scenario uh, based questions. So um, real, work, real life uh, experiences, clinical uh, examples, clinical scenarios um, uh, that puts the topic that the students have learnt, uh, uh, it contextualizes it, it puts it into a real life scenario which they can relate to. Um, clinical uh, kind of based scenarios are, are, are great for this. Um, another example is that um, you can also assess critical thinking skills or higher order thinking skills um, by asking uh, learners to analyze or, or interpret information from visuals, so whether that is a diagram, a graph, etc. Um, asking students to, uh, given, given a student a structure of uh, a diagram of a chromatogram or a structure of um, a, a cell, if you're, you know, if it's a, a, um, a topic relating to biology, and then structuring a STEM question based on a visual, um, that's, that's really effective. Um, and also what I often use um, when I'm designing my questions is I use my own research data um, uh, as, as a question. So it could be a simple graph, um, a simple chart um, that I incorporate as part of the question and students are asked to analyze, interpret and draw conclusions of, from the data presented. Again, that tests a higher order uh, of thinking. Um, instead of just asking them to recall uh, or memorize uh, a fact or a concept. So I've got some examples of how that can be implemented. 
One example is this. Um, so this uh, question really um, is a good example of how you can structure a multiple choice question to assess application. So application uh, is where students are using information or procedures and applying it to a new uh, situation. So here we've got um, a type of, uh, let's say clinical in a vague sense, example where um, there's a question relating to a patient with a specific age um, and they uh, in the question it details the blood glucose level um, um, of the patient uh, and the question asks the student what is the most plausible explanation of these numbers so the students got to use their knowledge um, of the topic of diabetes they've got some information they've got some data uh, and again, that's incorporating some multi-logical thinking um, that they need to um, apply um, in order to answer the question. And if you notice, the list of alternatives are similar in length as well. So there's a high level of discrimination that the student has to apply in order to choose the best answer because all of these answers are plausible um, so they need to really understand the question, know, have a, a good knowledge about the topic in order to identify the correct um, uh, option. Another example um, is this one here. Again, this question is, is a great example of how you construct a multiple choice question to test higher order thinking. Um, this question falls within the, the realm of um, analysis. So you're here asking students to um, use the information or procedure um, um, to or information then sorry I'll start again you're asking students to analyze data um, to support a conclusion so here I've got um, uh, a graph and a brief caption below uh, and the stem question simply asks without any other data which conclusion can you make from reviewing figure 17. So figure 17 is still part of the STEM question. So the student will need to review um, the information presented, analyze the data, understand the data, and then apply and draw conclusions in order to identify which um, answer from the list of alternatives is the correct answer. And again, this is something I like to apply in my own practice. Um, I use some research data um, and just change the data to suit the appropriate level. So if it's first year, I would, it will be, the data will be relevant for um, that level, uh, etc. So some um, four things that I want to um, just to share with you um, and just to make you aware of, and this is coming from my own practice over the six years of designing uh, assessments, uh, questions and multiple choice questions, some things that um, I want to share with you to help you as you, as you implement um, uh, incorporating higher order thinking in your own assessments. Um, one thing to remember is that Constructing higher order questions, uh, multiple choice questions, are can be challenging, it uh, can be time consuming, um, but what I have found is that when you're using key verbs from the learning objectives like I showed in that table, um, use the key verbs to help you so you'll be able to distinguish which learning objectives require lower level uh, thinking and which learning objectives require higher order thinking. The key verbs within the learning objectives should be able to help you um, identify um, what levels um, to structure your multiple choice questions. Uh, the next thing I wanted to share is that, um, again, specifically uh, when it comes to multiple choice questions that have higher order thinking, it's really important to have those questions moderated internally by your colleagues and um, just to make sure that, that the question does uh, test the learning objectives. Um, you've got the correct verbs that test higher order thinking um, and also that you've got the STEM question is structured with enough detail um, if you're testing um, a students ability to apply knowledge um, and have the right terminology if you're asking the students to um, 
recall or remember a specific uh, um, information. The next thing is that um, depending on the STEM question, you may need to add lots of content. So um, if your question is only testing knowledge or understanding, then you don't really need to add a lot of content in your STEM question. Um, like the example I had where uh, the students had to define what efficacy is, you don't need to add more content to that. Um, you can just present the question, what is efficacy? Or, um, and then list the list of alternatives. But if a question, um, a uh, multiple choice question requires students to analyze, apply or evaluate a question, then you need to add lots of content. So like in the previous slide where I showed the example of a, of a uh, bar chart uh, as part of the STEM question, you will need to um, you know, design that, not just the question, but also the data to match with it as well. If it's a case study or real life scenario, it will need lots of content um, so that the student from reading the, um, the question would be able to understand what is required and be able to answer the question. Again, um, in corporate scenarios, problem-based clinical scenarios, tables, graphs, charts, diagrams, etc., cetera, um, as part of your STEM question. And uh, this, quest this last point helps answer some of the previous questions that were raised by um, colleagues. Um, students will need more time depending on the type of multiple choice question. So if your multiple choice question requires higher order thinking, if it's more complex in nature, so if you're assessing some of the higher levels of of the ta Bloom's taxonomy, then you need to assign more time for the students uh, to be able to read the question, uh, understand the question, interpret the, the graph, interpret the data, and um, apply their understanding, draw conclusions in order to uh, answer the question and select their answer from the list of um, alternatives. So depending on uh, the level, what you're testing, more time um, will be given if it's uh, quite uh, complex. If it's only testing knowledge or understanding, then you don't need to allocate too much time for that specific question. And to summarize, um, the Bloom's taxonomy um, is a really, really good model that you can use um, to be able to determine if you are assessing um, high order thinking. Do use active verbs, to help you construct um, lower order and higher order thinking STEM questions. Um, use real life scenario um, based STEM questions, use visual, visuals, tables, charts, diagrams, when you want to assess higher level, higher order thinking. Um, and do, um, if this isn't currently implemented in your own departments, um, internally moderate your multiple choice questions and the whole exam paper um, by other colleagues and get feedback on the structure, um, the content, um, everything that I've covered in today's uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time and uh, your questions and I will open the floor to answer some more questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, for sparing the very long, lengthy talk. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think you need some re refreshment. Yes, I, I, <laughs> yes I, I'm just going to take a glass of water now. <laughs> I will uh, just review the questions and I will uh, try to simplify for you. Okay. <laughs> I have some water or some juice items. With you. Okay, we'll do. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Um, so I actually we have only exactly we have 15 minutes left. So okay. You'll try to concise the questions. And there are some common questions I have uh, seen. Uh, they are asking that whether we can use uh, true or false questions or it should be avoided. There's one common question. Okay, um, so 
you can use true, true and false questions. Um, in my institution, true and false questions aren't usually implemented. Um, what I will say is that if you have multiple choice questions that have uh, single best uh, answers, um, they are more reliable in terms of um, your ability to determine if students really uh, have uh, a, a, a deeper knowledge of the topic. If you have true or false questions, um, again, students are more likely to guess the answer if they don't know the answer again and from that you don't really know if they have a deeper knowledge so um we don't commonly use true and false questions just because it's easy for students to guess compared to if we have a single best answer um students are less like you you'll have a better idea if students know the answer um or if students have guessed if that helps, if I've explained it simply. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's one more question. I think it's uh, answer is yes for that. Whether we can use the graphs or diagrams in the STEM? Yes, yes, you can. Um, so um, I would encourage you to incorporate um, graphs or diagrams um, in your STEM question, especially if you want to uh, assess higher order thinking. Um, again, all that, the graphs or the, the data should be presented within the STEM and not as part of the, the list of alternatives. So yes, please do. And there is one more question from uh, Dr. Kumar Venkatesan. He's asking that, uh, can we have two answers like both A and B in MCQ? Um, okay, so I guess, that is similar to either um, all of the above. Again, um, I think it's better to avoid such to, such type of options, isn't it? Sorry, it's better to avoid. Yes, it's better to avoid. Again, having just one single best answer, um, it, it, it's best practice. Uh, you avoid students just just guessing, um, etc. So. Yeah, I, was, I would recommend avoiding. And there's one more question is there. Sometimes uh, to increase the difficulty level, we need to prepare tricky questions. It's from Dr. Vipin Joshi. Uh, what should be the percentage of tricky questions? Okay, um, okay, the tricky, the, 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 the term tricky questions, I, I guess um, we're not trying to, we don't want to trick our students, we want to be able to assess um, if they are able to achieve their learning objective. Um, so um, the amount of higher order thinking questions, so questions that require students to apply or analyze or evaluate um, information, um, should vary. Um, again, a good uh, exam paper should have um, some of the lower order questions, um, but also a, a good number of, of higher order questions. Again, it, it varies depend on, depending on the module, it depends on the learning objectives like, um, for that specific course or module, um, but I think that a good exam paper should have some elements of um, recalling facts, some elements that require students to um, use their, um, their information on new situations, some questions to um, apply knowledge. Again, um, the higher order thinking questions will require a lot of time, a lot of energy and cognitive process for the students. So um, I wouldn't suggest having all of your multiple choice questions that assess higher order thinking but just to vary it, increase it in, in, in level of difficulty. Uh, okay, there is one more question from, uh, I think, Dr. Abdullah Shatu. Um, what is the accepted maximum words uh, count for each question? Okay, so there isn't a specific guideline with regards to um, a word count. Um, again, if um, I would suggest the question should be concise, should be brief, um, have the correct terminology. If you're asking, uh, if the question only requires the students to um, recall information, then your question is going to be quite brief. But if it's to um, analyze uh, uh, data, then the amount of information might be quite uh, extensive, might be uh, 
a lot more. Um, but I, there isn't a, a, a given guideline with regards to the word count, um, just to make sure that the information presented is relevant uh, to the learning objective, it's relevant, it's, it's to the point, it's concise, it's brief, and um, there are no irrelevant uh, information within that piece of uh, that question. Yeah, there is one more question from um, I think uh, Raji Kaliyapurmal. She I answered her, but uh, I think she is not satisfied from my answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> STEM should be in question form or statement form or both. Can I? Can I um, let me find that question. Uh, the STEM should be in question yeah. form or statement form, or it should be in both form. <clears throat> okay, so uh, STEM should be. Um, you have flexibility with how you structure your STEM. So a STEM could be a, a question, it could be a scenario, uh, it could be a problem based, it could be a problem based, it could be uh, a case study. So you've got flexibility with regards to how you structure the STEM. Okay, and there's one more question, a series of questions from Dr. Ayu Patel. He was asking about the randomizing, the choices, in there, we should also have in um, in through the software, just like questionnaire. Okay. Okay. So um, I see a question from uh, Dr. Patel. Um, okay. So research options and randomizing the questions by using a software. Okay. Um, so in my okay. So it depends on um, on how you're delivering the multiple choice questions. Um, if it's an exam where students are sitting an exam with a, a paper, um, then you would randomize the position of the correct answer. Um, other summative assessments where students have to complete a short quiz, which comprises of a multiple choice question. Yes, you can use um, uh, software to randomize the questions so that, um, especially if students are going to be completing uh, the multiple choice at different times. Um, yes, you can use software to randomize the position of the, of the uh, questions as well as the positions of the alternatives as well. Okay. And there's one question from uh, our Vice Dean Mohammed Gazwani. <clears throat> In regard of making multiple module exams, what is the best way to arrange the order of questions? By which more easy questions can be come first and moderate to hard come later and how can we keep a similar order if the concept is applicable in other modules okay um so i would say that um for my approach i would increase the level of difficulty so um ask quite lower order thinking questions at the start and then increase the difficulty it doesn't have to be like that i get i it's based on how um, your specific department or or, um, or your uh, module team prefers. Um, the reason why I like to increase the level of difficulty is um, is so that uh, students it builds the students' confidence uh, in answering the questions. Uh, if a student first of all sees question one, it's a higher order thinking question. Um, and they don't know or, you know, it, 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 they, they, they often struggle um, and it kind of knocks their confidence. But where you've got a question that kind of builds on the level of difficulty, um, you know, students, everyone should be able to answer the most basic questions. Um, and then you'll be able to see as the, the level of difficulty of the questions increases, which students um, have actually studied well, which students um, don't really have a thorough understanding of the topic, etc. So I like to increase um, the level of difficulty. I know other colleagues within my department um, have a similar um, approach when constructing multiple choice questions as well. Okay, done. Alhamdulillah. And Dr. Ayub also, he just supported for us to, he gave an idea. I think it should be by topic wise, as we have taught them, the difficulty should be according to the topic wise, the, based on the outcome, the objective of the question. Yes, I mean, um, 
the the difficulty yeah can be based on the topic but i think every topic you should be able to um design a question that tests lower order thinking as well as test higher order thinking as well um, there should be scope for every topic to assess both levels of, uh, of thinking um, again it depends on the learning objective as well um, for that module um, there is one question from Muhammad Mahtab Alam sometime knowingly we ask it some difficult questions with confusing options either to reduce grades or make, sh uh, make pressure on students how can we avoid this situation? Okay, so um, one suggestion, um, again, to um, before the students sit the exam, to share your exam paper with a colleague and just to make sure that um, the questions are, um, are written at the appropriate level, uh, the, the correct difficulty, etc. Um, again, I think it's important to be able to um, have different different levels of difficulty with questions um, so there's nothing wrong with having a question that tests higher order thinking where students are asked to um, make a justify or come to a conclusion based on a specific question not all students will be able to demonstrate higher order thinking um, so it's important to have a range of questions that that um, assess the various levels um, for the students Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you answered it. And there's one more question is that how to measure the difficulty, level of difficulty that a question is 25 percent, 50 percent, or 75 percent is difficult. This from Yavid Ahmed. I think. Um, uh, I have to mention level of difficulty. A question: 20 percent of. Yeah, 50 percent or 75 percent is it difficult? How to measure it? Um, so difficult. <laughs> yeah, I don't really understand the question. Um, you have to mention level to give uh, I let, let me explain to you. Let me explain to the world what do you mean in this question. Uh, usually, uh, in our colleges or in our university, sometimes we used to follow this type of instructions that you have to make the questions in 25 percent, 50 percent, 75 percent difficult. Okay, so um, how to uh, measure it? How to measure the level of difficulty? Okay, uh, right. So I'm just going to go back to the Bloom's taxonomy triangle uh, to help me answer this question. Okay, so um, can you see the screen? Okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so um, looking at the Bloom's taxonomy, um, these are the I would say questions that ask lower order thinking. So these will be normally the, the easier type questions. Um, so you could, if you have a specific requirement with regards to percentage, uh, maybe say that um, you have a specific percentage, 25%, uh, let's say, I don't know, that ask that, would, that, that falls under this, these two categories. Um, and then you have another percentage that assesses um, uh, question, that have questions that assess students' ability to apply and analyze, and then you have um, a, another percentage of students uh, questions that require students to evaluate. So you've got uh, a range of questions of different uh, amounts that assess a range of these levels. So students should all be able to at least uh, achieve this level. Um, but students who have studied, who have uh, prepared for the exam, should be able to also answer questions based on these three levels as well. Um, if that helps, if that answers the question, I'm not too sure. Yeah, there is one more common question here. They are asking about the, what is your suggestion to make higher order thinking MCQs in, in medicinal chemistry? I think this is your field. <laughs> Yes, um, so are they asking examples or? Yeah, they are asking examples uh, or suggestions. Okay, um, oh, put, uh, I'm on the spot now. Uh, okay, so for medicinal chemistry. Yeah. Okay, so um, for example, you could 
um, have you could have um, a um, um, a mechanism. Let's just say an example of a reaction mechanism, um, and uh, ask students to be able to um, to identify what what type of reaction that is. Um, you could have questions relating to um, computational chemistry, um, where it's a it's a it's a problem based scenario. Um, again, you can take that from from research um, and then ask students based on that, um, and that will be assessing the the higher levels of of thinking because you've got some data, you've got a diagram of something that um, students are will need to review, analyze, or interpret and draw conclusions from. Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, the, the, the scope, and I'm happy to, to add some more um, practical uh, examples. Include the session because, you know, most of the uh, questions are nearby repeated. Yes. So I think uh, uh, we can conclude the session. Okay. So, yeah, we are going to finish. We are nearing the time limit. Uh, here there is one question. Uh, I think the last one. We are asking some example. So that is means uh, based on your experience, what is the main disadvantages of MCQ and assessment? Okay. Um, disadvantages. Okay, so disadvantages. Um, one disadvantage that comes to mind is that um, it's not with MCQs. It's not an effective way to be able to test the student's ability to organize in, organize their thoughts or creative ideas. Um, yes, you can assess higher order thinking, but um, MCQs are quite limited. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, assess the abilities, uh, students' ability to organize their thoughts uh, on paper. Um, and I think that's where, you know, long answered or short answer questions really come in nicely um, in exam questions. Um, another thing, I don't know if this is something that you implement in your university, but also negative marking. Um, we don't incorporate this, um, but if you do incorporate negative marking as part of your MCQ, um, it's it's very hard to under know if students have uh, understood the question. Uh, uh, if so, if students uh, know the answer to the question, because they might be presented with a question and they are fifty percent certain of the answer, um, but they do not choose to answer that question because if they select the wrong answer, they will be negative marked. Um, so those are some of the um, disadvantages that, that, that I can think of right now about um, of multiple choice. But I think the, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Um, it's a lot more reliable. Um, it can be easily implemented to a large cohort of students. You can test a broad range of course content, course material, via multiple choice questions compared to um, short answer or long answer questions. Uh, there is only one final question. That there is something, um, something he's asking regarding the graphs and pictures. Yes. Uh, could we assign more than one question in each stem, especially when we're using graphs and tables? Sorry, could you repeat that? You can use it. No, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, could we assign more than one question in each stem, especially when we're using graphs and tables? Um, I would say that the, the, the stem question should be specific, should be really specific. So if you've got a graph um, within your stem, it should only be for that one question. Um, yeah, it should only be for that question. If you want to uh, ask further questions based on that piece of data, you can also include incorporate that same uh, graph or table in a long or short answer question, in a short answer question, for example. But um, yeah, just to kind of 
make it more specific, more focused, have a, specific, um, a data or graph for one MCQ question. Okay, Doctor. Thank you so much. Um, but I think we have to conclude uh, because the session will expire. So, no, it's fine. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think we took a long time with you. Uh, it's a lengthy lecture you have given us. And, uh, and I would like to thank uh, the e-learning deanship and Dr. Riyad is there with us and the host. And he's supporting us from the e-learning deanship. And I thank Dr. Uh, our dean for giving us the great opportunity um, to have a wonderful session today. And I thank Dr. Elizabeth for giving your valuable time and your energy too. <laughs> we took a lot of energy from you today. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. You.